<laughs> hey, folks. Um, welcome. We got a great conversation. We got uh, Will Richardson, who is um, kind of one of my heroes. I'm a little bit uh, starstruck <laughs> to have a conversation Please. with Will today. <laughs> That's right. Please. This is this is man love, Will. Get used to oh, it. Man. So let me do a you quick intro a, for those. You need that... to get a life, Matt. If I'm one of your, you, you need to get a life if you're starstruck <laughs> talking to me. But anyway, is, go ahead. Go ahead. I do need to get a life. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. So real quick, um, Will, educator of a bunch of years, he um, runs, co-founder of a group called the Big Question Institute. Did I get that right? Big Questions Institute. Yeah. Questions Institute. Um, but I know him because he's prolific in terms of his writing his uh, thinking, his really challenging of the system and the status quo. And so, um, uh, Will, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So I hope that you're, you've got an adult beverage, Will, because <laughs> I... No, this is just water. This is, oh, that's my really goodness. Just water. Well, that's all it is. Really it's technically not drinking alone, right? <laughs> that's correct. Mm. Okay, here's what we're going to do today. So folks that are listening... Um, let me bring up this in, link, in LinkedIn real quick. So folks that are listening, we're going to do a couple things. One is we're going to allow you to obviously comment, uh, but then to join the conversation as well. There's a way I can do that with our system. And so um, as I hear people making comments, some people who may we want to go deeper in, we'll bring them up and we'll have more conversation. All right. So, Will, what I thought I would do is to start... Um, I was going to start about basketball, but we probably should get down to business. An hour is going to go really quickly when we're talking about education. So what I think I will start with then is a question to get us started. And that is this. Um, what do you think a child is going to need in 2032 to survive, thrive, however you want to describe that? So a way to start with a softball, right? I mean, that, that, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> that, one's, that one's really easy, right? Let's get it. Um, yep. Two word well, answer. you know, I mean, uh, look, I, th I think that, and we, we talk about and write, write about this all the time. I mean, and I, I think everybody's finally beginning to come around to the idea that kids need to be learners more than anything else. I mean, we, we've always kind of felt that and said that, but um, most of what we've done to them in the past is we've schooled them um, and we haven't really developed and nurtured them as learners with agency who can pursue their bliss, use their creativity, you know, be critical thinkers in the real world, right? That um, they need to be able to process a whole bunch of stuff that's happening in the world right now. And we, we just don't do that. We, we just do it in this very kind of con contrived, constrained environment. Artificial. Where, yeah, where it's really just about what we want them to learn. And, um, not about how to use their own power, their own, again, their own agency to yeah. uh, to figure it out on their own, to be learners on their own, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if you're not a learner right now, you're in trouble, right? I mean, no as, as quickly as as quickly as things that are changing and innovating and you know whatever else. Um, so, I mean, they'll need a lot of things, obviously, but I think that's first and foremost yeah. what we always have needed, and I think we need it even, you know, in triplicate right now. Yeah. So, you know, when I think about that question of what is a child going to need? I mean, part of me says we don't really know, right? We don't know the details, but we definitely know the concepts and the kind of the, the way they approach life. And, and what you're, you're saying is that really they need to approach life as, as you know, almost fearless, right? Yeah. Change is happening. And so how do I deal with, how do I adjust and pivot? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it could be, you know, they might need therapy. Who knows? I mean, it could be the type of, you know, it's like it could be the type of environment at that point that really is even, again, um, you know, 10 times more complex and stressful and fraught and yeah. whatever else than it is now. Let's hope not. Right. But um, I mean, things are are trending in a not so great direction in the sense that a lot of stuff is just breaking right now. You know, yeah. a lot of the a lot of the narratives and stories that we've lived by for a long, long time, um, a lot of the power structures, a lot of the ways that we orient ourselves in the world. You know, one of the metaphors that I've been reading a lot and that I think is really appropriate is we need new maps. You know, I mean, the maps just aren't getting us to the places where um, we want to go. Um, so let me pause so, you. you know, let me pause you on that, because, you know, the, the image here is actually a map. Right. And so. 
Oh, look um, at that. <laughs> the, the question that I'm struggling with, though, is that when we think about maps, we tend to think about an actual destination. Like, again, I, I talk to a lot of parents, as you know, and so they, you know, they think about, I want my child to be, you know, X. I want them to have a degree, but not necessarily anything around what that means. Those are destinations as opposed to direction. And, um, you know, our system is all about kind of these very hard um, destination points that don't seem to make much sense anymore. So the mapping, how, how would you create a map when you don't really have a sense of what the direction or the, the, the destination is going to be? Well, if you, if you think about a map as simply being something that helps you kind of navigate the space that you're in, right? I think that that's probably more what, what people are talking about when they use that, that yeah. metaphor. But, um, and I don't think it's necessarily a hard and fast destination as much as it is just thriving, right? Just being able to kind of know where you are. <laughs> even if it's even if you're not necessarily going anywhere, at least like I kind of can make sense of the world, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of know how these roads go. I know we're north and south, and you know what I'm saying, right? So, um, I, I, I think uh, um, it's getting harder and harder to to orient ourselves, to try to make sense, right? And and I don't know if we've talked about this before in the you know call we had before, but certainly that idea of sense making, that idea of mm. being able to kind of process everything that's happening and make some sense out of it, um, not just in a kind of information literacy context, but just in a, I mean, look at everything, read the New York Times today, you know, yeah. and just kind of go, okay, so what does all this mean? Like, what, how do, how does all of this change the way that I have to think about living my life? Um, I have to think about kind of, um, again, thriving in what is, you know, and, and the world's always been chaotic, I get it, but it's hard to argue that it's not, um, it's not more intense right now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the pandemic obviously has had a lot to do with that, but the, we're, we're looking at some really existential challenges right now. And so how we kind of make sense of that is, is, uh, is really difficult and schools are not preparing us for that. And I don't want to, you know, that's a lot to put on schools, right? To continually evolve and iterate so that they are contextually in the moment and able to help kids understand, you know, that's a lot to, yeah. to try to ask. But by the same token, I think we could do a lot more in education if we got rid of a whole bunch of legacy practices and structures and systems that are really standing in the way of developing those types of skills. Yeah. So Leonard uh, brings up a point. Um, thanks for the comment, Leonard. And for the folks Leonard, listening. We have some people. Yes. Yep. yep feel free to <laughs> send questions. Um, I actually am looking for really hard hitting questions. So really try to stump the chumps on this deal. Um, <laughs> Wow. But <laughs> <laughs> chumps and bald headed guys and geez, man, we're <laughs> just just being honest, Will. So Leonard <laughs> says you can have maps of where you don't want your kid to end up. I think that's actually pretty interesting. I think the destination is pretty open and free for them to choose, he says, but there are known destinations to help them avoid, maybe. What do you think of that? Well, um, yeah. Um, but ultimately, you know, um, I don't know about you, I don't have anybody giving me the destinations anymore in my adult life. You know, I'm kind of picking them out. I have to choose what destinations I end up in. So sure, there are lots of places we don't want to end up. None of us want to end up there, but it depends on the choices that we make as we go through our lives, you know? And I have two somewhat grown kids, 20, 24 and 22 years old, right? And um, I think I can kind of breathe easily that their decision-making that they're able to do in their lives right now is leading them to some good destinations or some healthy destinations. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, I, I can't, I'm not going to like um, erase all the places that I don't want them to go. Um, you know, they have so, to kind of figure that out on their own. Yeah. I mean, I guess what I heard from Leonard is, and Leonard, you're welcome to elaborate on that, but what I'm hearing from Leonard, where, where is, can I see Leonard's comment? Can I see that? on oh, LinkedIn? Somewhere? Well, I brought it up onto the screen. When I read it, okay. I just took it away, but Sorry. I'll mention no it worries. next time I bring it up. Um, <laughs> no yeah, yeah, I'll bring, make, mention it next time I bring it up. You can also open the feed, the LinkedIn um, uh, yeah. feed, and then you'll see it. It's a little time delay, but you'll see the comments there. Oh, yeah, I see it. Okay, yeah. thanks. So yep. I think what Leonard's getting at, again, I want to speak for him, but I think what he's getting at is that 
some places I know I don't want to get my child uh, is is to be stuck, right? To get to a place yeah. where where they have so zoned in on what they want to be, they haven't thought about who they are. As an example, um, they haven't kept options open. They've doubled down on strategies that are vulnerable to disruption. Those are places that I personally, I, I mean, I, I get down with with some of what Leonard described there. Yeah, I, I mean, sure. I, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, ultimately, um, they're going to make those decisions. So, you know, it's just about building their capacity as well as we can to do that. Yep. Well, all right. So resetting the room just briefly, uh, again, Will Richardson, Matt Barnes, we're talking about really education and, and, and all that all that it entails. Uh, we're going to take some specific questions here in a minute from folks that have sent me some things prior. Um, and so let me start that now. So Will, you know, one of the issues that keeps coming up is uh, around parents, right? You, you've heard about this argument that's now kind of starting to break loose around who's in charge and politicians are, you know, spinning that for their own benefit, as they often do. Um, but, you know, how do you do you make sense of that? Or how do you make sense of kind of the, the power structure that's happening in the power control of, of parents coming into board meetings, board of education exactly. meetings and wanting to ban books and yep. Yep. <laughs> stop talking yep. about, you know, gender and all that kind of stuff. Well, look, I, I mean, I think that um, <laughs> how long do we have? Right. Uh, you know, there's so many levels to that. I mean, some of it is political. Some of it is fear. Some of it is, I think, um, just people not wanting the world to change. Um, and and so really doubling down on the way that things were uh, or have been in the past, even though those things weren't very steeped in justice or equity or any of that stuff. Right. But that's kind of what we know. And um, so we want to, you know, just get that back. Um, I, I think it's I think it's dangerous. Um, I, I don't know. In fact, this is something that is on my mind a lot. I don't know how this ends up. I don't know how I saw a video today of a, I think it was in Tennessee, Tennessee today passed a law where I think it's every library book now has to be approved by the state legislature oh, or something wow. like that. It's like really crazy. Right. And they passed it by 60 to 28 or something. So, I mean, it's not, it wasn't even like, but one of the people who voted against it was questioning someone who's maybe it was the sponsor of the bill. And he said, what are you going to do with the, all these books that you're going to throw out? You're going to put them on the street. You're going to light them on fire. And the guy actually said, well, yeah, burning them is a good idea. Wow. So We've taken a step back. You know, oh my gosh. You take that rhetoric and it now gets really kind of dangerous. And it, yeah. it, it really, I, and so anyway, I don't know how this ends up. Um, I, I think that we're on a path that is going to destroy public education as we know it. Because um, what's going to happen is, is that it's going to get so vitriolic, it's going to get so kind of divided that the people who can opt out are going to opt out. They're going to yes. just take their kids and they're going to put them other places where they, you know, are maybe are not, you know, having to deal with all that kind of stuff. And then the kids who are stuck in the system are really going to get an even more narrow view of the world. Um, but isn't that, that already happening, Will? Hasn't that, been, hasn't that been happening the last 20 years? Just maybe it's accelerating now? Well, you know, I, it depends on where you are. Right? Yeah. There's no question. It depends on where you are, right? Um, I, I think that, you know, the school where I taught here down the road for 22 years, where my kids went to high school, I think they got, a, a you know, as much as you can get a really good education from public, from a public school, and again, I don't mean to sound really disparaging of schools in general, but I think all schools have a, a fundamental problem mm. when it comes to the way that they think about what learning is, how it happens and how they make those experiences happen in schools. Right. So I think everybody's kind of under the bus when it comes to that, not the individuals, but just the system. Yeah. But I mean, look, I think that they were able to talk about things. They were able to 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 kind of respectfully push back against their teachers. They read all sorts of things that were of interest to them. They had certain agency to pursue their own interests to a certain extent. Right. And it, it, it really was more about, um, you know, how, how can we nurture these kids to be good human beings and citizens rather than at this total emphasis on how can I, what do I need to do to get into the best college, right? What do I need to do to get the best grades, to get, take the best, I mean, kids taking like 14 AP courses, like 
you know, it's like, stop, you know, yes. <laughs> that's not what this is about. Um, but anyway, so, so I'm kind of can't kind of rambling, but but I, I don't know how this ends. And um, I will say just really fast. So I don't know if you heard uh, this Michigan State Senator this week, uh, Mallory McMorrow, who stood up and she pushed back against this rhetoric. Huh. Um, there was another senator in the Michigan State House who, in an e fundraising email, called her by name a groomer, um, that she wanted kids to be pedophiles. You know, I mean, it was it was awful. And so she stood up and she gave this four and a half minute speech that went totally viral. You can find it. Just look at look at her name, Mallory McMorrow. In fact, I posted it on my LinkedIn feed. Yeah, and I think I did hear about it, that. It, yeah, it's, it's been seen 15 million times now. Oh my. So guess what? She's my former student. Oh, you're kidding. She, she was in my English classes, right? And and she was great. No, I'm not kidding. It was like, I've been like, mind has been blown, you know, just kind of just listening to her. She's so articulate. She's And she's a product of public school education, you know? I mean, she's, a, she's an example that not only can kids kind of navigate the system if they have to, but they can they can flourish and that there are good aspects of the system. But she went to a school where she was allowed to debate yeah. those things, where yeah. she was allowed to read a variety of things, right? Yeah. Where she had a very kind of um, broad understanding of the world. And so many kids in this country, especially right now, are not getting that. And they're going to get less and less and less of that. Their view of the world is going to be even narrower and narrower and narrower. And and that is dangerous. It's That's right. just really dangerous. Let me take a quick uh, uh, comment here. Uh, if you look at the screen, um, again, Leonard saying, I think I dislike uh, there being legal censorship in what schools have to have to and can't teach. I would prefer schools to have the option to decide and for parents ultimately decide where the kid goes to school based on the values or the things the kids will be taught or exposed to. So, um, you know, Leonard is. You know, yeah, go ahead. No, I get I get that. I understand that. Right. But one of the functions of a public school education in this country is to make sure that all values are kind of discussed in respectful ways that that we we see diversity and we talk about it and we wrangle with it and that it's not just that you get to a place where everybody agrees with your worldview. Um, I understand it, you know, and I'm not I'm not, you know, pushing back real hard on this. But look, I mean, and, and, you know, this is this, again, is one of the big problems that we're facing right now um, is, is we don't know. We're losing a sense of who we are collectively because we're not hearing the stories and the narratives and the variations on the theme that have, you know, if I'm going to get somewhat patriotic here in a, in a moment, which does not happen very often. But that is what America was kind of built on, this idea that this is a melting pot of ideas of people and that our strength is that we can navigate all of that, right? Yeah. Well, now we're saying, no, 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 no. We can't, we can't engage in anything that doesn't look like us or that we don't like. Well, well I'll, that's I'll, not the real world. And I want to sharpen you know? that a little bit because it's. I think I, my sense is that the, the debate or the challenge here is that we don't want to enter into dialogue, right? When we, when, we, when we talk to someone who doesn't believe or agree with what our beliefs are, our beliefs are, we actually want to pull away from that. And that is the opposite of right. what a democracy actually needs to function. We actually need Absolutely. to hear every perspective, not necessarily as an endorsement, but as a viewpoint, and then be able to dialogue about it, keeping our same, our same passions, our same beliefs intact, uh, and, and again, as people increasingly, I think it's driven by a lot of politics, it's driven by our media, our social media, which we'll get into in a minute, that is actually driving us apart, I think, as, as well. It's, it's making us hard to, to listen or hear from anyone else. I had, a, I had an idea for a T-shirt the other day, and it was basically simply, democracy demands diversity. It does. Well, I, I, will, mean, add, I will do another T-shirt that say democracy demands dialogue. And yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So it's all, it's all but, of it, right? But, but, but I think almost the, the diversity piece comes first, because if you, you the dialogue is senseless if you don't have diversity in there. Right. Um, fair, and fair. if you're just talking, fair. if you're just yeah. talking back it's and forth echo in the chamber. echo chamber, mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's the, that that dialogue is meaningless. Yeah. By and large. I get you here. Let's look uh, a uh, note from Keel. 
uh, we have to start taking an individualized approach. If we ask, quote, what will the child need, it depends on the child. One of the worst elements of institutional mass schooling is the one-size-fits-all curriculum, amen, Keel. Lockstep, age, age segregated advancement and constant group learning. I, that's like Keel's one of my other heroes. So he's, yeah. I got, I got, I got uh, mad love for Keel. Thank you for that <laughs> comment, Keel. Um, yeah. So, so if we have these um, grouped, artificially grouped areas and in, in organizations or, or classrooms that then can't have dialogue, then we've got a double whammy. I think. Now, how do you have personalized conversation or personalized instruction while also creating the forums for dialogue? That's that's a challenge. What do you what do you think that that uh, that looks well, like? So I'm going to push back on the term first of all. Please. I think personalized personalized instruction is is not that's not what we want. Personalized means that's something that's being done to me. Someone is personalizing my curriculum. Someone is choosing what it is, but they're making it for me, right? The, I think the word is personal. I think we need to have personal curriculum. And that means that we have agency, again, that we have some choice in what it is that we are learning and that we then dialogue with other people in a sense of, A, number one, helping us understand whatever that is more deeply and hopefully, again, more more broadly. Um, but And then B, um, to, to use that as a teachable moment in, in the communities in which we operate, right? In the school community where, where kids all the time, you know, the people will listen to kids say amazing things and go, oh my God, you know, that just blew my mind. Well, that's because we never hear those stories. Right. We don't see them. Um, those are happening all the time. Kids are blowing our minds all the time yeah. if we let them. And, and so, you know, that requires, though, that we, we think about it a little bit differently. Um, but, uh, yeah, I agree. You know, curriculum, age groupings, all that stuff. Nobody would ever start a school like that right. if learning was the objective. No one would ever put those conditions into a school if, if what they started with was we want kids to be really deep and powerful learners in their lives, right? Oh, let's let's put them in rows. Yeah, let's make it all about grades. Sure, yes. let's make it fifty-minute blocks of stuff that they find no relevance, no interest, and have no agency over. That'll really develop them as learners. So, you know? all right. I mean, so, so, Will, here's the question, right? So, we know that if we were to wipe the slate and just build from scratch, it would be vastly different than where we are now. But we are stuck. We're just horribly stuck in this momentum that that keeps the school as it is. So, you know, how do we get unstuck? Well, that's the part that frustrates the heck out of me. I don't know. <laughs> so here's all right. So then I, I don't know. I mean, it look, it when we we, you know, we talk about this all the time with the people that we work with, you know, because we we are in our work, we one of our commitments is to tell the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. That we want to make sure that people hear the truth about how difficult change work is. And the reality of it is, if you want to change the way that the experience of school rolls out for kids and teachers, it's easier to build for it than it is to change something that's been around for a right. long time. Of course. That's just the reality of it. Right. There are so many legacy pressures, narratives, systems, structures that all have, as you know, Seymour Papert said famously in a quote, this kind of autoimmune response sure. to change. And and so when change happens, everybody kind of dances, you know, they do the steps for a little while, but mm, pretty soon, you know, everybody kind of just says, no, we don't want to dance that step. And we want to dance the music that we grew up with. You know, that's not a great metaphor, but you get my, you get what I'm saying. Absolutely. And, and I'll never forget too, Andy Kamenetz had a book about five, six years ago, ago called DIYU, like do your, do it yourself university. And she interviewed a Fortune 500 CEO and she said, you know, there's all these different ways that we can educate ourselves now, you know, and some of that stuff is really powerful and there's really great ways to do it. And he was like, absolutely. He goes, the world has totally changed when it comes to getting educated. Um, but um, it, when it comes to my kid in my school, don't experiment on my daughter. I know what I know what the path is. I know what I know where the rule what the rules are, quote unquote. Yeah. I know how to, you know, she knows she's figured out the game. So don't change the rules midstream. Um, she's going to go through. She's going to get that degree. She's going to, you know, regardless of the fact that the world is an open. So open. and Keel brings up a similar point, which is that all the parents and I, I have this problem all the time. Every parent wants 
school and education to look like they experienced, right? So age, age segregation yep. is the issue that Keel's bringing up, but it's also grades. It's also, you know, you got to take these course these courses and I've got to submit to the expectations of a university uh, that's also operating in, you know, the, the 20th century, maybe, heck, maybe 19th right. century, right? So the assumptions that are baked within the adults are now driving the outcomes and the activities of the young people. Sure. And so but here's... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say those assumptions are reinforced everywhere you look. One of the things, one of the things that I think is really interesting um, in like early mid August, start looking at the commercials and the advertisements for back to school. Oh yeah, and it, it's it's fascinating <laughs> because the view that people portray of school, you could have had that same ad on TV if there was a TV in 1905. Yes. I mean, it, it's it, it's it's amazing. Kids raising their hands dutifully, yes. waiting for the teacher at the yes. front of the room. Pretty, you know, clean little pencils. I mean, the whole thing is just reinforced, reinforced by by media. And, and it's because we want our kids. We want to recognize the experience that our kids are having to to, you know, to all of a sudden say, wait, I don't understand why. Why are you doing competency based assessment again? Well, that's not what I did, you know, and you can make the argument as much as you want for that. But people are still going to be like, mm, like in Maine and Vermont, that's what they did. They went to competency based five years later. They went up. They went out of competency based. They went back to letter grades because parents couldn't deal with the fact that their kids weren't getting like a B plus or, yeah. you know, so it's 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 embedded in the experience and that's why um and but that does come back to we need to tell better stories we need to be better storytellers in education if we mm. really want change mm. we have to change the narrative in people's heads and i think we do that actually by students telling stories bingo um and really putting that out there yeah yeah festus writes uh we just need to start building i, I think there's some truth to that festus the idea that um, at some point we just are going to need to build the new model and let People, and it's actually happening, but let people choose with their feet. And as they start to choose, there's going to be more and more attrition from the old model. But then the stories, I think you're right, Will, we've got to have better stories. That's actually a place where I have struggled because I don't know if, you know, my kids are following a very different pathway. I actually have one that's more traditional and two that are not. And I have hesitated to really talk about them individually but I feel like we need to talk about individual kids so that the stories of what they're learning yeah. and how, they're, how their experience is so dramatically different and wonderful, Absolutely. harder in many cases. But without those stories, it's hard for people to compare. So Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, my kids, my, my daughter, um, are, we, are we live in public? Because she didn't go to college. And, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, she's, she's 24 and very successful. But, you know, it's like, well, where is she going to school? And, you know, she took a gap year and then she took another gap year and then she took a third gap year. And we thought it was going to be a gap life. Right. But <laughs> she figured it out. She yeah. found something she was really interested in. And she really did D DIY you, basically, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and I tell that story all the time. And, and you know, she's a success. Yep. But people can't translate that to their own children for some reason. I'm not, you know, and I, I get it. Right. So, um, he, okay, let uh, me, let me step in here because this is a space that I like, I live in and I breathe it. And, and the issue is one of fear. And so every parent, you know, from the day they're born, we're yeah. afraid that something bad is going to happen to that child. That's why we, that's why when the, you know, we bring the baby home, you probably did this. You don't hear them. You run into the room and go, Hey, are you, are you breathing? Right. You check because we're, oh, we're right. constantly afraid. And so that fear then also gets played up by our culture that asks every moment, every waking hour, where are you going to school? My daughter is 17 and she's taking, yeah, she's actually exactly. doing a program called Discover Praxis, which is an apprenticeship program. And everybody cool. keeps peppering her. Where are you going to college? Where are you going to college? Where are you? And as if that is the only model and the only direction. Anyway, that's a cultural dy dynamic that really bothers the heck out of me. But it's 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 hard for a young person then to live in that space, constantly be, you know, giving these messages of what to expect and what they should be doing, and then go a different direction. Here's a quick uh, comment from Leonard. You see it on the on your screen. Um, I think it also lets the school avoid criticism uh, or modern canceling. This cancel culture, I guess, is what he's talking about. They protect themselves by being able to say everyone gets the same curriculum and attention across schools and children or demographics, even if that's, if that's not really true. So I think there is some defensiveness here that schools are saying, well, we're going to make things simple, right? So we're going to make it so um, 
uh, un- uninteresting, <laughs> that nobody gets offended, and we never have to deal with a tough, uh, tough subject. And you know, I think that's a logical approach. Unfortunately, it's not preparing a kid for for the future. It's easier that way. It is. It is. Um, <laughs> Carl says, and I'm going to bring this up real quick. I love, I love this quote. Fear is the mind killer. And this was from the fantastic Frank book, Herbert. Dune. Dune. Yep, yep. Fear is the mind killer. But again, most of the parents I interact with and really we come just right below the surface is this fear that I'm going to injure, you know, they're going to injure their kid. Their kid's not going to have a bright future. Um, and again, when you see every, like 80% or 90% of the kids following one path and you're not, it does make it kind of, you know, scary to imagine doing something differently. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I remember way back when, when I was a little kid, um, you know, there was, there was my, my, I was a, uh, I had a single parent, right? My mom had a lot of fear, obviously. Yeah. Um, so fear isn't new. Um, you know, parents fearing for their child's future. I mean, I, I'm, I'm old enough to almost remember the, you know, the Lyndon Johnson daffodil ad, whatever that was when, you know, there was this countdown and this big oh, mushroom, mushroom cloud, cloud. Yeah, in the yeah, background, yeah. you know, um, and, and so it, people have been stoking fear all the time. And, you know, actually, um, media just in general plays on our amygdalas, right? They want us, it's an, it's fear is addictive. Um, insecurity is addictive. We keep coming back all the time. One of the best things I've done in my life is just shut off all cable news and pretty much all social media news after the election. I think I would have probably been in an asylum by yes. now if I had kept, you know, and I just cut it all out. I still, you know, read the paper, read the Times, I, I, I read still, but I'm constantly aware that headlines are, are clickbait for my amygdala yep. and that if it fear is what keeps us coming back. And so, um, you know, I don't know how you do that though. I don't know how you make people fear less about what's happening in a moment where there are a lot of things that actually we should fear. Okay. Right now, right? Well, let me, but, let me pause because here is what I have found that helps. Um, and I, I also invite folks who, you know, I'm, I'm looking at Carl, you're an industrial uh, teacher. I would love to maybe have a quick conversation because there's this whole conversation we could be having around trade preparation and job readiness, which had some conversations with folks in the last two days about that. So if you're interested, okay, um, Carl says he's willing to come on. So I'll send you a quick uh, note in a minute. Carl will bring you up. Um, but I want to start with this question right here. When I found that this issue of fear is because people, parents in particular, don't realize the dangers of doing nothing differently. And so I ask parents this question, does school prepare a child for adulthood? 90, I don't know, 5% of the time, parents will answer this in the negative, right? We all know that they, it, school doesn't prepare for adulthood. It prepares something radically different. And then the second question, you can see their college credential means a child's workforce ready. That's also a place where most parents say, no, it's not true anymore. Uh, maybe if it ever was. And then this third one, college ke- teaches kids to either know things or do things. And it, without fail, with some exceptions, the answer is to know things. But we live in a world where if you know things, heck, we have access to information. But if you can know how to do things, now you're marketable, you can create value. When parents start, in my view experience at least, when parents start to see the disconnect between what they're hoping for and what they're actually getting, then they start to um, uh, they start to say, okay, maybe there's some danger in doing nothing differently. I think the question then becomes that though, um, okay, so what's the alternative? Yes, right. That's right. Right, because, because you know, the change of the type that we're talking about in all institutions is slow. In, in schools, it's glacial. Yes. Right. I mean, um, I can't imagine that. I mean, I mean, we in the, in the schools we work with, we're constantly asking them, you know, what what does this place look like in 15 years, in 20 years, in 30 years? You know, what are the things that are sacred to you that you want to make sure still occur in that time frame? But then what's different? You know, what do you see differently? And and when when you give people a, a, a timeline that allows them to be really aspirational, their vision for what the experience of school is, is really different. 
Yes. Um, you know, they because they're they I think they feel like, well, yeah, maybe in 15 years, you know, we could get to that place. Parents don't have 15 years to no. wait. You know, parents Kids have shouldn't. 15 minutes. You know, they have <laughs> they, they want, you know, or or maybe they're lucky enough to live somewhere where they can find an alternative, where they can find a school that, that is different. Yeah, and so and then now we get into this question of and Carl, I sent you a note to your uh, message, your LinkedIn message, and so if you just click that link, you'll be brought into the waiting room. Um, so now we get in this question of all right, if parents are or, or young people are trying to do something different, and there's no model out there they can easily plug into, now what they're actually doing is creating their own, and that's you know talk about scary, and that's kind of what we had to fall into. Thankfully, we had a lot of resources and support in order to do that. But nowadays, there's so many other opportunities to, to do that. And so let me bring up um, uh, Carl. And Carl, let me see if I can get you assigned here. All right, I don't see your uh, web. There you go. Hey, Carl, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Welcome. Welcome. Hey, so, Carl. <laughs> Carl, what part of the world are you? Hey, I'm up in Canada at the top of Lake Superior right now. Lake Superior, fantastic. Well, welcome, welcome. What I wanted to check with you about was you are industri or industrial uh, industrial teacher, right? Yeah. So how how do you see that as either you know growing uh, the opportunities in the trades space? Um, I don't know, Will, if you spend much time in that space, but you know, what are your thoughts about it, Carl? Well, I, I work with I work with. Yeah, with the trades, with um, with the world of the, the skilled crafts, and I'm working with um, with adults who were once in the school system, and I see firsthand what it did to them, and I feel bad. I was a part of the uh, the public school system myself for seven years during the '90s, and I I really feel bad if they. Um, if they have a fear for what's going to happen in what should be a wonderful learning experience. Yeah. You know, if there's a fear of failure, if there's a fear that there's going to be a test at the end of the week, I think that was one of your topics, you know, and, and so you realize that where they are now, to some degree, is a product of what we put them through in their schooling years. I did that for seven years. It, it, so you were industrial teacher for those seven years and you you weren't happy with the outcomes is that what you're suggesting well i i guess you know what i looked at is is that so often as a high school teacher you know kids couldn't join my you know some kids couldn't join my robotics class and build robots from scratch and and go to a competition with me in india because their parents were worried that it will damage their ah. academic progress this semester i mean we always did find a group of kids to take and and they would train like Olympians, uh, uh, you know, almost uh, all week for, for two, three months straight yeah. to get ready to go. But and some of them did have academic consequences for participating. But when I look back now at those groups, it was it was it was it was always boys. But we took uh, two groups of boys, eight boys, uh, two years in a row, 97 and 98 to compete in a robotics competition in India. And I look at where they all are now because wow. it's now 22, 23 years later. I, I'm just amazed at where they are with their lives. So Will, there's what's a your, lot of room to change the model for learning for, yeah. for young people. Will, what's your take on industrial um, instruction and, and training? Well, I mean, look, I think that um, I remember uh, we, we had like an industrial arts classroom when I was in school, you know, where we'd go in and we learn how to build stuff and, you know, design stuff and birdhouses, right? And some of them were, some of them were, were pretty, pretty uh, funny looking, but, but still there was this, this aspect of just working with your hands and making things. Making and things. I mean, yeah. in many, in many ways, in many ways, industrial ed, I think is the precursor to the maker movement. You know yeah. I mean? And, yeah, absolutely. And, and a lot of, yeah. And a lot of, a lot of those, actually a lot of those classrooms and a lot of schools have been turned into maker spaces. Um, which, which I think is, is, you know, a good thing. I think that making and, um, you know, designing and, uh, bricolage and, you know, just doing things with your hands and, and really creating something tangible is a really important part of, of learning and, and, uh, of growing pizza, you know, parts of our brains 
that don't get grown like that when we're just sitting in a classroom reading a textbook or you know working on paper or whatever else yeah sure bring so many different competencies and skills together too absolutely in one yeah. place. Well, hey, Carl. And my, kid, my kids didn't get any of that, by the way, in high school. I mean, you know, in the last 10 years here where they went when they went through because all those programs were gone. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and it's the same thing, by the way, with just arts in general. You sure. Know, um, and, and the way that they've been sidelined. So maybe the broader question here again is this. Where is where do we expect children to be moving into the future? Like 2023, 2033, what? What skills do we expect that child to have or to need? And problem solving always comes up on that list. Agency, autonomy, flexible thinking, uh, and then the, all the so-called soft skills that you get in theater programs and other places, right? Creative skills you get in art. Those are really rising in prominence, but they still have a stigma associated with them because the traditional college coursework doesn't value those those activities. So anyway, uh, Carl, listen, I really appreciate you coming on the conversation. Um, thanks, Carl. Yeah, yeah. And thanks for what you do. Uh, we oh, need a lot. Enjoying the dialogue. Fantastic. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, when I, we when we get up to Canada, we'll, we'll come visit. And if you come down to Houston, uh, <laughs> come on down. Do not come in August. You will literally wow. melt. You from Canada. You I've been melt. there. It's hot. Yep. <laughs> All right. Take Thank care, you. Carl. Okay. Um, again, just to quickly reset the room, we've got about 20 more minutes in this conversation. Well, I hope I'm really enjoying the conversation. It's always great to, uh, to talk with you. I want to now dial it into something that you and I talked about last time we were on the phone together. And this is about social media and the implications of exponential technology, uh, a planet that um, I think increasingly people can't argue that the planet is in trouble. Uh, you know, people I think are arguing about, can we change it? Can we do anything about it? Are humans and responsible? There's definitely something going on that no one, increasingly people can't debate. So if that is also where kids are going, where the future is going, and again, could you actually maybe, could you start by doing a brief, brief description or explanation of your concerns with social media and exponential, exponential tech generally? Are you able to do that or? Well, I think, you know, social media, social media in and of itself the technologies i don't think are necessarily good or bad i think the problem with with exponential technologies um is the biggest problem is that they they do have biases built into the code right i mean you, you, it's almost inescapable that um there is such a thing as a just totally neutral technology but having said that it's still more about the ways in which we use it, right? I mean, it's the ways in which we are, we have literacies around how to um, both consume and create information these mm -hmm. days, right? And to, again, make, make sense of, of all of that information that's coming across our screens, be able to come to some hopefully valid conclusion about what's true and what's not true. Um, and and to um, to really try not to end up in an echo chamber where everybody's just you know telling you confirmation bias, where everybody's just telling you what you want to hear and what you're predisposed to hear. I think that you know I, I have been challenged in the last um, in the last six months or so to really push out of my kind of comfort zone right yeah. and i've been reading i've been reading more people sane people who are, are making sane arguments right. that right. that you know are, i'm trying to wrap my brain around them i'm trying to understand them one of them just for example since it's in the news is this whole elon musk thing with twitter so you know what is free speech you know i mean this is really challenging us to to unpack something that forever was just like well you, the only thing you can't do is yell fire in a crowded room exactly. if there's not a fire right everything else well okay but you it's it's inarguable that a lot of that stuff that's in the everything else bucket has a real negative impact right. on our prospects for democracy well, right yeah i mean so, physical danger you know, as well as the danger for the yeah. democracy yeah so so Elon Musk says, well, we want free speech. We want free speech. But of course, he's blocking people left and right on Twitter, right? So that's there's some irony there. But look, I I, I, I was a journalism major. I, I was a journalist. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked as a reporter. Um, I get it that, you know, we need to have a free press and free speech and all that kind of stuff. 
Um, but there's a cost if you don't have a, a consuming public yes. that can make sense of what people are saying, right? So free speech, you can say whatever you want as long as most people can make sense of it and go, oh, that's just BS right. and you know that's stupid and you know the election wasn't stolen and there are no pedophiles in a pizza place in DC, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Right. But it's dangerous when people are simply just throwing out lies and the worst part of it is um, when they're saying, don't believe anything you read in the press. Yes. Right? So let me and pause that is, that is the Yeah, that is the first, let's be honest about it. That is the first step. You want to neuter the press. You want to neuter what has been seen as at least truth. Again, you know, I say this all the time. I'm old enough to remember Walter Cronkite when yeah. he was the most trusted man in America. Right. 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 Um, that's just been destroyed now. Yeah. And um, so social media amplifies is both the best of us and the worst of us. Yes. And unfortunately, I think, again, because we are predisposed to fear and conflict and all that kind of stuff, um, you get a lot of people who just prey on that. And and um, and and because of the anonymity of it as well, just become really abusive and bad people. And, you know, it's, so it's like that part of it. And I don't know what to do about that. All right. So, so Zach <laughs> don't Stein. Don't ask me what to do about that. <laughs> yeah. We talked about Zach Stein, uh, who has this quote that I've used, I don't know, a thousand times since I first read it, which is um, if education isn't the answer, then you're asking the wrong question. And so when yeah. I ask questions about social media, what you said was, and I'm going to challenge you a little bit, you said that the danger is in the, in the speech. It's actually the danger in a population that, like you said, can't actually discern what is rational right. thought from what is hyperbole or just straight lies. And when a, a, a large population can't do that, then people who do make up things have a power that they, did, they wouldn't normally have. So if education right. did a better job, if our educational system did a better job of helping kids learn how to think, how to hear an argument and be able to navigate the, the logic of the argument, be able to recognize, okay, that's a plausible idea, but it's not probable. Um, those are the things yeah. that happen in dialogue that doesn't now right. happen in a school. Yeah. And I think we get to there by banning books in libraries. <laughs> Right, exactly. That just makes it that makes it I mean, so much worse. The first part, what you just said there, Matt, I can't imagine anyone would sit there and say to you, No, I don't want that. I don't I want know, my kids to be able to I think. Know. I don't want my kids to be able to be critical thinkers. No, I don't really want that. Every but in the same breath they'll go they'll go, absolutely, absolutely. But then in the next breath they'll go, but we're gonna ban like, you know, twenty five percent of all the books in the library. And and oh by the way, a, a former president of ours on the campaign trail before he was elected said when he won the primary in Nevada famously said we love the undereducated so I think that there is a real question as to whether or not we want actually an educated populace that can make sense of everything that's going on because if we had that it would make it a lot more difficult for people to to just gain power and hold on to power and um well, well let's to, expand it you know, too Will. No, no doubt. There's no doubt you're right about that. But it's also an, un, an uneducated population. It's a lot easier to, to sell them things. It's a lot, a lot easier Absolutely. to uh, to get them in oh. debt. Right. It's a lot easier. Well, to, that's a, but, but, you know, that's a whole nother hour. Right. <laughs> in terms of how we're just basically um, the the um, the, you know, consumer driven economy um, that we have been subjected to. Yeah, is terrible. Here's a here's a little exercise for you. My wife and I have, have been doing this now for three weeks and we still haven't found one. Try to when you're watching TV the next time and a yeah. food commercial comes up, see if you can find any food on screen that's good for you. Oh, yeah, like literally nothing. <laughs> I mean, you look at the, you know, the fast food commercials, everything on the screen is bad for you, literally. And yeah. we have, by the way, 40 percent of our kids are obese in yes. this country. Yes. I mean, you know, you can't you can't look at those two things and go, oh, maybe we should start, you know, maybe showing healthier food for people to eat, maybe, you know, whatever. But that but but we've again conditioned through the market, um, you know, that 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 this is how money is made. And that is the problem. Right. I mean, the problem is. So have you ever heard of donut economics? 
I have heard of the. I don't know that. Have I you can't, heard of this? I've heard of it, but so I can't remember I, the details. I heard of. I heard about it a little a little bit ago, but then I came back to it this week, and it's just this really fascinating idea that basically there are there's a a, a band where basically we can flourish, right? Um, and if we under if we're if we're in the middle of the donut, then oh. we're we're not educated enough. You know, we're, it's like you know, there's all these kinds of weaknesses that we have. But if we get to the other side of the band, if we go to the outside of the donut, then we get climate catastrophe, we get racism, we get all these other things. And that really, in this this economic frame, that you know, it's all about how do we live in, in the do- in the the donut part, right? Um, and it, it's really fascinating, but. One of the things, as I've been kind of cruising through that this week, it is absolutely amazing the extent to which the very few own, like, most of everything in the world. I know. And that's not sustainable. It's It's just not sustainable, you know. So capitalism is, in many ways, I think... Um, really be getting stressed because people are finally kind of saying, this is not sustainable. We can't keep doing it this way. We can't make it all about selling bad food to people to make the most profits that we can, despite the fact that they're all getting obese right. and we getting diabetes. Yeah, and you externalize yeah, I mean, the costs. That's, that's the old. Right. That's the old so, so you look at play, you, and then, but now there are these companies like Patagonia, right? And Patagonia is standing up, and they're they're they have a moral conscience. They are they have an environmental conscience, and they are they are really not selling people crap. Yeah, you know you know what I'm saying, right? I, I do. Mean, they're I do. A very I... different different way about it, and and actually their board is saying to them, it's not all about the money that you make. Yeah. You don't constantly have to make you know like profit and whatever else, but. Even that, I'm not that I'm not I'm not making a great argument on that, but I think you get my drift. Like, there I, I know is it's a change. There's an expectation that shareholders have now yeah. that are saying to companies, "You can't keep doing this crap. You can't keep doing it." Um, well, I, yeah, I I think you know the <laughs> the the point that you're making is there's just a handful of companies that we can actually point to who have who have taken a moral stance around ethical. Let's call it ethical capitalism. I mean, I'm not sure if that's the right, right. language. You know, my bro- my yeah, parents, maybe. my parents and I went to dinner uh, last night, and we got to talking about Elon Musk, and that he now controls a, a quarter of a trillion dollars individually. Like, at w- in what universe is that healthy for a society? <laughs> Right. Do you ever do you know do you know the site McSweeney's? Have you ever heard of McSweeney's? No. It's this satire site. It's great. It's this satire site. So they had a thing today on you know Elon Musk sought on free speech, and he goes, "Turns out free speech costs forty four billion dollars." <laughs> <laughs> that's right, and only a few you people know. can afford to can afford to buy know, that that's free right. speech. Yeah, right. So now he's got free speech, and you know he can do whatever he wants with yeah, it. Yeah. Oh, God, it's just, well, it's all right. Crazy. So back to this tech piece. Um, so the donut economics sounds similar to what Tristan Harris described in uh, one of yeah. his podcasts and in some of his writing and his speak, speaking around right. on the left side, you've got, um, you've got totalitarian control. And as technology allows countries, China being the, probably the most, the most egregious example, could, companies, oh, I'm sorry, countries can actually control their population by watching their conversations Artificial yeah. intelligence can constantly be running in the background to find out if there's a dissident. They identify them, identify their contacts, and immediately take them out before there's even a, a question, right? That's possible now. On the sure. other side is this um, other potential catastrophe, catastrophe, which is large numbers of people who are so fractured and so unable to think and be responsible with their freedom that they, uh, they tear each other apart. Right? They, and, and I think that's the, the risk and the worry that's happening here in, democ- in the United States and other democracies. In the middle is where you have a, a population that is discerning enough, responsible enough, I would say long-term thinking enough, that they can actually anticipate the dynamics that their government's trying to do to control them and anticipate the risks of being a fractured society, not being able to have conversations with one another and how that actually destroys a community. So that middle space is, in my view, where education must fill. Education must prepare people to, to live in that middle space. But again, as we started the conversation, 
there's very little that's happening in the educational space that actually does so. So that's that's uh, that's that's uh, Tristan Harris, uh, his yeah. pers- perspective on that. And so <laughs> you're bumming. This is bumming me out because the more I listen to you, Matt, the more I start believing that no one wants us to be educated in those. Well, ways. that's why I'm. That's why I have to have a beer with me when we have these conversations. <laughs> Because it really is a, a threat to power. I mean, that's what all, look, all of this is about power at the end of the day. And most, many people see power in terms of money, um, but a lot of people see power in terms of policy and, you know, in terms of, of whatever else, right? But, you know, if we really wanted kids to test us, you know, to constantly be probing and to be challenging and to stand up like, you know, the framers and (laughs) debate and do all that kind of stuff. Why wouldn't we be doing that stuff already? Right. Right. There you go. Yeah. See this, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No one's going to. But how do we so how do we I don't know how we overthrow them if we've all been educated into not knowing how to overthrow them. So, yeah, well, all right, now you're bumming me out. I'm going to have to do, drink something a little, <laughs> a little heavier than, than, than beer next time we talk. Um, well, I still, you know, as we start to wind this down, I still am putting my, my bet on the, pow- the, the second most powerful force in the universe next to God himself. You know what that power is, Will? The power of a parent fighting for their child, Right. So that's the that's the money shot for me. That's what I'm banking on. If 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 I can help and others can help, parents understand that the opportunities for their kids are huge, but the parent has to take a completely different role in this deal. They can't they can't look at the school and say fix my kid, educate my kid, get him prepared for the the world. We know that that's not going to happen at least in any time horizon that that's going to work for families with kids today. So that is to me the the money shot that I'm going for. Well, and I, I do think that parents have power and I'll, I'll leave you on an up note. So last night, actually, we did a presentation to um, a parent group in Quebec. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we, we kind of went through our standard, you know, spiel where we talked about the challenges. We talked about the dissonance between how we learn and how we do school. We talked about how um, in many ways we're illiterate and, you know, all of that stuff. And at the end of it, most of the parents were like, you're absolutely right. Yeah, we 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 get that. You know, we we really feel that, too. And and I think there was a sense that they really wanted change to happen, but yes. they don't know what that change looks like, really. And they don't know how to uh, if make, you know, make uh, affect it yeah. in any short term way. Yeah. Well, um, so there are there, there are trailblazers that are out there that are showing how it's done. And maybe in a future conversation, we can bring some of those folks on for further conversations. So cool. Will Richardson, Big Questions Institute, uh, here's yeah. how to get a hold of him or his website. Uh, please hit him up. He's got a fantastic blog on that site, as well as uh, other resources that are free and, of course, paid resources as well. Um, <laughs> got to mention the paid stuff, too, Will. And then uh, for those uh, those that want to come back, what we're gonna what I'm gonna start doing is trying to do maybe a weekly of this deal, and I'm gonna bring my wife on um, <laughs> next time. You see that beauty and the beast. I'm laughing that picture of you. You look so angry, man. You I am angry. angry. You know. You need- <laughs> <laughs> I am angry. I'm almost, if I'm if I don't know if I didn't know you, I'd look at that going. I'm not going to watch that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got Beauty on the left and the Beast on the right. The so, and then uh, we're gonna have Mike Yates, who is a really really thoughtful guy um, around education and around schools and the changes that are needed. I don't know if you know uh, Mike uh, Will, but uh, really really great guy. So that's coming up next week and. Um, so for now, Will, thank you so much for the conversation. And thanks, um, thanks also for, for getting me, uh, you know, sharing some information that, that really opened my eyes to this larger, more complicated and somewhat more dystopian <laughs> kind of view of what might be coming in our society. It's motivated me. To, it's caused me. To, yeah, it's caused me to drink more. It also caused me to <laughs> to think that, about this work as being more than just uh, changing education. It's actually more. It's it's a it's an existential dynamic here. So, 
one breath at a time. Yep. That's yep. It. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Right, uh, next time right. uh, I'll buy you a beer. Okay. All right. Good to see you. Take care of yourself, Cheers. buddy. And that's it for us. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.